My name is Henry Hardy. I have been associated with publishing in one form or another for all, most of my adult life. I began as a, an Oxford undergraduate um, and then graduate and at all stages in my life, uh, including those and even before those at school, I've always been fascinated by the process of putting together a publishable book or magazine out of disparate material which either existed in advance of my project or which I asked people to write so that I could have a project. Uh, it's a rather bizarre uh, taste in activity, but it's certainly been mine all my life. After I'd finished graduate work at Oxford, I went into the world of publishing, briefly in London, and then joining OUP in 1977 where I worked for 13 years, publishing books for the general reader, to begin with in the, their general books department for some years, and then, well, nine, eight or nine years, and then being transferred to an academic department, publishing academic books in politics, sociology, and social anthropology. I remember in particular one of the books I commissioned in the first sector of my OUP job, there was a series called Opus, which stands for Oxford Paperbacks University Series, which was the successor to the old Home University Library, which were books aimed at general readers about serious subjects written in a way that they could understand. And I commissioned Brian Farrell to write a book called The Standing of Psychoanalysis, which was a topic of great interest to me, particularly given Karl Popper's view that psychoanalysis couldn't be a science because it was unfalsifiable. So I recommend that book if you're interested in that topic. Anyway, I got to know Isaiah Berlin at Wolfson College, which I joined as a graduate student in 1972, and I was immediately transfixed by him. He was uh, such an amazing person, and what was even more uh, exciting for me was that he was the perfect object for my rather obsessional taste for literary organisation. It turned out that he had published very little of the work that he'd written and was very disinclined to do anything about it. So he was, if you like, an author waiting for an editor. And I was an editor waiting for an author. And so quite serendipitously, our paths crossed and we got on well. And I proposed to him that I should do an edition of his works, which he agreed to, to the surprise of people who knew him, because he'd turned down a whole lot of other people who'd suggested doing this. But somehow he thought that uh, it would be OK to agree to it in my case, partly perhaps because I was a graduate student at his college and he was always supportive of any projects that the students of his college undertook. And this was uh, this was mine. So... For the first 10 or so years of my association with him, I collected together all the articles that he had published in rather obscure places. He had published a good deal, more than people realised, but they were scattered in opaque periodicals that nobody had ever heard of. So we published four books between 1978 and 1980. A book of philosophy essays, a book of essays in the history of ideas, a book of essays about Russian thinkers of the 19th century, and finally, a book called Personal Impressions, which is his take on a whole range of people of widely differing characteristics, exhibiting brilliantly his capacity to get into the skin of people who were very often totally different from himself, understand what made them tick and reproduce their personalities on the page. Then, later on, at the end of the 80s, he was remaking his will, and he asked if I would be one of his literary executors. There were to be three others. I said, yes, of course I would, but I wanted to know what I'd have to be dealing with. I didn't want to wait till he died and then suddenly find out that there was more or less than I expected. So he said, OK, come and look. So I did a tour of his house, beginning in the attic, going through every room downwards, through the house until I got to the cellar, which was the main repository of material that I subsequently worked on. And I was absolutely bowled over by the amount of material I discovered. 
and the quality of it and the finished state of much of it. There were lots and lots of finished essays or lectures which hardly needed anything done to them apart from the provision of references for the quotations, which is another story, to make them eminently publishable. And from that time on, from 1990, for the last seven years of his life, I did battle with him, successive battle with him on a series of volumes. He always resisted my suggestions that a book should be published. He, he thought it wasn't good enough. He thought it was another book too soon. He had doubts about certain kinds of material being made public at all. And the book I've written recently has a, a section at the beginning which tells the story of the, these battles, um, almost all, but not all of which I won, happily. And when the book finally came out, he was always pleased. And when I started suggesting a new one, he was just as difficult and just as obstructive as he was. He didn't become any more relaxed about publication. Then when he died, there was a whole lot of stuff which I wanted to publish which couldn't come out in his lifetime for one reason or another. So another seven books, I think, appeared after his life and after that, four very fat volumes of his letters. And his letters are wonderful and uh, some people think that they are, in a way, his greatest work. So I'm very glad to have done those too. And the last volume of those was published in 2015. So it, it was a 40-year job. I wondered if you can draw any connections with Robert Burton's urge to draw on wide-ranging sources and amass a kind of huge library, and whether that instinct or driver tells us anything about scholars' mental states, if we can draw any connection. Whether I'm motivated by uh, the same factors as, as Robert Burton in writing The Anatomy of Melancholy, I can't say because I'm not cognizant of Burton's psychopathology. But it does ring a bell with me. Certainly my own taste for gathering material from a wide variety of places and organising it so that it's presented to the reader in the most usable and friendly way and signposted and explained where necessary so that it becomes a resource for people who are interested in the relevant field to return to in years to come. That certainly is something which speaks to me very much. And I suspect that it tends to be a rather obsessive character trait and that I wouldn't be at all surprised to, to know that there is some statistical link between that kind of temperament and the temperament that becomes depressed. What pleasure or rewards do you find in the, the challenge of ordering? I suppose the satisfaction of a job well done. Uh, in, in the case of the works that I've organised, I had a kind of mental blueprint in my mind from the beginning. I had a picture of, if you like, a row of books on a shelf which would be the final product of an enormous organisational process. And it was many, many years in the making. And each book, as it landed on the desk from the publisher when it first came in, gave me certainly a wave of satisfaction, although, as with all such things, one very quickly loses that and becomes preoccupied with the next project. <laughs> but in another way, also, there has been a huge discussion of Berlin's ideas in the secondary academic literature since I began my project. And there's no doubt there's a direct causal link between putting out these books and the centrality of Berlin and his ideas in public discourse, if you like, public intellectual discourse. And that, of course, brings me enormous satisfaction because... Berlin's ideas seem to me extremely important. I think he's a very wise man. I think he's got a lot to say to us now in our current predicament. And I'm really glad to have been able to play a role in, in putting the ideas out there and making them work. It's quite interesting, Henry, isn't it? Because some of the reviewers have suggested that without your input at this task over the last 40 years, mm -hmm. Um, Berlin, if he was remembered, would be remembered as brilliant but slightly ephemeral. Mm. Uh, so you've, you, your activity, it's almost like a co-production of mm. his works over that time. Mm. Um, because from reading your book, the process of editing 
required continual kind of clarification and pinning down mm. both what was meant but also the sources of mm. the quotations, for example, that you're mm. talking about. Mm. Yes, I think some people have said, I think, too strongly that Berlin would be forgotten if I hadn't been his editor. I mean, that, that's not quite true. First of all, he was, by the time I met him, world famous. But he was world famous as a living man who was heard on the radio, seen on television, and in academic life he was famous as a fluent lecturer and somebody who, whose conversation was amazing, who talked about ideas in an exciting way. He defines an intellectual as someone who wants ideas to be as interesting as possible. And by that criterion, he was a consummate intellectual. So all of that was already in place. But if we hadn't been able to publish a lot more of his work in the way that we have, I think when he died, he would have rapidly disappeared from people's consciousness, would just become a memory of those who knew him, and, and people would be dimly aware of him. But I think now the body of work is sufficiently large and strong that he will become a permanent fixture in the intellectual firmament, and that's what I wanted to achieve. At the end of your uh, recent book, Henry, you mm. talk about the fact that you suffered from depression mm. during, you know, well, for, for many years. Mm. And I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about how that affected you in terms of your ability to do this task mm. or, or more generally function in life. Mm. Yes, you want to know how my becoming depressed affected my work um, well. I first became consciously depressed in the year after Isaiah Berlin died. He died in 1997, so it was in 1998 that I first went to my GP with symptoms which she immediately described as absolutely textbook depression. Um, <clears throat> and um, in the state I was then, I couldn't work creatively at all. I was able to cope with in boring administrative tasks. I could keep, I could sort of keep going. I could still turn up and bath my children and read to them and that kind of thing, but I couldn't do any intellectual work of any importance. So it was very important to me that I could get clear of the depression if I could. And I was put on tricyclics by the GP and they didn't really work. And eventually I came to see you, as you know, John Geddes, with whom we tried various things and eventually became totally sorted, as I am now. So I would say that being successfully treated for depression is an absolutely necessary precondition for doing the kind of work that I'm doing. If I hadn't been able to find a way of successfully treating my condition, I wouldn't have been able to do the work I've done. I would have had to do something else completely. I know other people in this position who have found academic work brings them down in mood. And if they can't find a way out of it, a lot of them that I know, they just give up and they go and do something else. Somebody I won't name became a gardener after a major depressive breakdown and an attempted suicide and is still a gardener to this day. I probably would have enjoyed being a gardener, but I'm very glad that I was able to do the work that I have always wanted to do since I met Berlin. And, and that's only because of the wonders of paroxetine. It's interesting, isn't it, thinking of one of the things we know is that different people with depression respond or get benefit from different things. Mm. And you've already touched mm. on the potential that gardening might be effective mm. for some people. Mm. But also, I think in your case, you're suggesting the drug treatment was effective. So possibly you could say a little bit about how that's been effective and maybe any other things that you've found to be helpful for mm. depression over the years. Mm. Well, uh, one thing I found vital and extremely useful, and I'm sure this is well known to everybody who is involved in the field, is regular exercise. And recently I was diagnosed as type 2 diabetic and told that uh, one of the things I should do is to take regular exercise and I was already swimming every other day and because of this diagnosis I now swim every day and I'm absolutely transformed by that. I mean I would say that was a necessary, just as necessary a part of, of the regime of treatment of depression as, as the medication. 
So that's been very important. And I think having proper breaks, taking time off, not trying to work too many hours a day, that kind of thing helps as well. But probably, if I had to name the one thing that is most crucial above all else, it has to be the medication. Uh, again, my experience is no doubt the same as that of others, and that is that being on SSRIs is a very, very slow process. If you read what it says on the packet, it suggests that you may notice a benefit in, in a couple of weeks. Well, this may be true for other people, but it certainly isn't true for me. I recently tried to reduce my dosage of paroxetine because I wondered if I could get away with a smaller dose and very quickly began to sense depression returning within two weeks. So I restored the dose that I was on before and it took 13 weeks for that to get back to where it was. So one of the f enormous frustrations of early stages of treatment is that you just have to wait and of course if it turns out that the drug that you're trying isn't the one for you for whatever reason you've then got yet another period of an equal length where you try the next one and that is the most difficult phase because you know, you're waiting and you don't even know if there's a destination that you're waiting for. But once you get there, it's terrific. I'm feeling fine at the moment, and I know that I wouldn't be if I wasn't on the medication, so I th thank my lucky stars daily that this kind of medication exists. There is what people describe as a kind of emotionally flattening effect of being on SSRIs. You perhaps don't have such highs. Moments of emotional excitement aren't quite as intense as they would be if you weren't medicated. But if that's the necessary price to pay for having the moments of being low eliminated, then it's a price worth paying. Other people would be the best judge of that. I think people who knew one before one was medicated and after should be asked, are you the same person or have you changed? And if so, how have you changed? That's not a question I can answer, but some people I know have said I'm a bit different. But I feel I'm still myself. And do you do you feel that you have an understanding of <coughs> what brought on the first depression? It's speculative, isn't it? Uh, uh, I mean, roughly speaking, as I understand it, depression is either endogenous or caused by circumstances in your life. And there are a very large number of members of my family who have been depressed. And so I suspect that I have a genetic precondition in that direction and it started at about the age of 50 which I think is another sign of that perhaps because I understand that this kind of depression often manifests itself at around that time in someone's life but also I've no doubt that specific um, events and difficulties in your life are triggers and uh, I would say that uh, Berlin's death which affected me enormously was such a trigger not the only one in my life but probably the most easily identifiable and the most powerful. What is the difference between sadness and depression? Goodness knows. It's very difficult to define that in a verbal way. Um, I'm not even sure that if I was sad or depressed, I would be 100% sure in either case that I was wholly one or wholly the other. I feel that there is a kind of crepuscular continuum between them. But your question implies that they are experientially completely distinct. The thing about depression is that it's all pervasive. Uh, whatever you do or look at is drained of the capacity to make you feel cheerful or enthusiastic or involved. Um, one experience I particularly associate with depression is standing on a hill looking at a most fantastic sunset which would normally lift the spirits and thinking intellectually this is one of the most beautiful sunsets I've ever seen and can describe why but not having any sensations of pleasure or joy at seeing it so there's a complete disjunction between the intellectual appreciation of beauty and the emotional effect of beauty and depression destroys the latter in, in my view whereas sadness more typically can be tied to a particular thing so if you know somebody you love dies then you're very sad about that and at the conscious level probably you connect the emotional state you're in to the event that caused it so that's the best I can do about separating the two. What I would like your kind of summary of is what is the importance of Berlin's 
thought and philosophy. Why is he an important philosopher? What areas does he particularly focus on? And you said that he was important, particularly in the modern world. So what mm. aspect does he speak to particularly? What is the importance of Berlin's ideas? That is the $64,000 question, and I'm about to start writing a book in which I try to summarize this. So <laughs> the jury is out, but I, of course I have a, a, a conception in my mind. One of the most central things in his intellectual vision is his conviction that free will, human free will, and the choice that goes with it is an absolutely central and essential feature of human life and should always be respected and never suppressed. So from his childhood, he had a visceral revulsion against any attempt by any individual or institution or authority to force somebody into a system or a set of beliefs or a way of behavior that they hadn't chosen for themselves as just totally beyond the pale. So when he was eight, for example, he went out on a walk with his governess in Petrograd or St. Petersburg uh, during the March Revolution, the March Russian Revolution, the Social Democratic Revolution, and he saw a policeman who worked for the Tsar being dragged away by a lynch mob and it was quite plain that he was going to be strung up or have his throat cut or whatever it was and he said this really entered into his soul and he felt that this was a kind of emblem of everything that he subsequently recoiled against so he wrote a famous lecture called two concerts of liberty when he became a professor at oxford which although it doesn't name the Soviet Union, it's plainly about Soviet totalitarianism. That was one of the most awful examples in his view of a system that ground down people's freedom of choice and stopped them moving in directions they wanted to move in, becoming the sort of people they wanted to become. And the state spied on you and required you to behave in certain ways. And if you didn't, you were put in labor camps in Siberia. We know about all of that. So that's part of it. Linked to that is what's generally called pluralism or value pluralism, which is his view that human beings are enormously varied in terms of what goals they can pursue, what kind of people they can become, and that you shouldn't believe that there is or try to impose any kind of unitary system on human society or on human beings. So any religion that says there's one right way to live and you're bad unless you do it this way, uh, or any political system which says there's one right way to behave and you must follow this, is anathema to him. So he's a terrific fan of variety, open-endedness, the patron saint of untidiness, I call him. He doesn't believe in blueprints and systems. And that is another very important aspect of his thought. And there are issues that come up today a good deal in terms of, let us say, multiculturalism. Should we be welcoming towards different cultural forms in a given society, or should we try and bring everybody into line with some local way of doing things? How should we behave towards immigrants? In a global world, one's brought up more and more against different cultures and different ways of doing things, and you have to form an attitude to them. You have to decide whether to be tolerant or whether to fight against them. And sometimes it'll be one and sometimes it'll be the other. This is the area in which his ideas operate and, and it's uh, terribly important today. Your own search, I mean, your book's about, you know, searching for Berlin. You've also sought treatments and strategies for dealing mm. with your own depression. Mm. It strikes me that people find different solutions. Mm. I mean, in general, people may mm. get benefit from psychological therapies like mm. CBT or drug treatment. Mm. But there are other things that add to successful management of depression in each individual. Mm. What, what advice might you give to other people who suffer from depression about how to engage with the task of finding out what works for that individual themselves? How do you decide how to cope with your depression? What do you try and in what order? Well, it's difficult uh, because, of course, for different people, different solutions will work. And you can't, therefore, <laughs> rather like what I was saying just now, you can't provide a blueprint of uh, which will work for everybody. For example, I understand from the data that cognitive behavior therapy is found useful by a very large number of the people who engage in it. I myself found it 
totally 100% ineffective. I just have a, I suppose, a sceptical cast of mind which just can't suspend disbelief in the way that's required. I also found talking therapy equally useless. I think perhaps I had a bad therapist, but my suspicion is that that wasn't the only reason. I suppose there's something to be said for trying the, the non-drug versions first, because you know none of us want to be on drugs unnecessarily. So I suppose to plunge straight into drugs at the first moment might be a bit premature, although in fact that's what I did. So I suppose I would say to people, try the talking, try the cognitive behaviour, but don't wait too long, because it becomes pretty plain quite soon. I think sooner with those, actually, than with the, the drugs, whether or not they're working for you, then move on to, to the drugs. But there are other things in life which are terrifically important. Um, a happy marriage is one, for example. I would certainly put my marriage up there with paroxetine as, as a key factor. The other thing, Henry, that we've spoken about is that you, first of all, were treated with tricyclic antidepressants mm -hmm. and you've had a range of different drug treatments. So mm -hmm. potentially there also has to be a degree of willingness to try out different antidepressants because some seem to work for some people and some don't. Mm -hmm. And I don't know what your experience of the trial and error involved in drug treatment has been. The trial and error involved in drug treatment is one of the most maddening and frustrating aspects of trying to deal with depression, precisely because it takes so long to discover whether a particular drug is effective. And if it isn't, then a whole other long period of experimentation takes place. I believe, I'm not sure if I'm right, but I believe that GPs try tricyclics first, partly for medical reasons, but partly because they're cheaper to buy, or at least they were at the time. But then you're presented, if you decide that, or if you find that tricyclics don't work and you, you think you want to move on to something else, you then have to choose among a wide range of alternatives. And this is really difficult for the reason I give, because it takes such a long time. But how do you know which one to start with? So what happened in my case was that I knew somebody well who had been very helped by a particular drug, which was paroxetine. And I suggested to John Geddes that it might be worth trying that. And he went along with that. I didn't quite understand why, because I don't think there's any guarantee that one person will be helped by the same drug as another. But this was a relative, so maybe there was some likelihood of a similar response. But even when, as I found, that drug was successful, there's still a nagging question at the back of your mind. If I'd tried something else, might that be better? The person I'm talking about had a bad episode recently, about a year ago, and the drug paroxetine, which had been helping him for 20 years, became totally ineffective. And he had a period of months when he was trying to sort himself out, and eventually a new psychiatrist gave him venlafaxine, and he's absolutely fine on that now. So there's a complete change of drug. And so not only do you not know whether you're on the right drug, but you don't know whether it's going to work for you permanently. Uh, so that's a kind of, you, you, there was always a feeling, might I be feeling even better if I was on something else? But you're not going to try because nobody wants to go through the period of withdrawal and starting again. Uh, so you're content to stick with the devil you know, even that may not be the best devil in town. What am I going to do now that I've got to the end of the, the major Berlin project? Well, first of all, that project never really ends. I'm not ruling out there being further books of his work, because there's plenty of unpublished work. But also, I want to write another book in which I summarise his ideas in a way that lay readers can understand, sort of Bluffer's Guide to Berlin's Ideas, if you like. So I'm hoping that that will happen. But by another stroke of good fortune, I know another person who's named Brian McGee, who is now 88, and he has appointed me as his literary executor, I'm a little bit doubtful about this because I'm a great deal older than I was when I began the Berlin Project, but there is another project of similar scale, which I've only just started on, and that will keep me going till my dying day or my demented day, whichever comes first. I find, although the role of exercise and outdoor activity in combating depression is important, and I find that regular daily exercise is, is, is magic in that in that way. 
but even a regular swim doesn't do the same as a long walk in the countryside. It sort of goes further into the interstices of your psyche than just a quick burst of swimming. Both of us, my wife and I, find a day's walk in the country has an enormously positive effect on our mood and also on our feeling of physical well-being. So I think that if you've got time to walk, or it could be to be in the garden, I also like doing heavy gardening, chopping trees and so on, either of those or both, I would say, are near the top of the list for therapy for depression. Kipling's Just So Stories is a book I grew up with. It was certainly one of the books my father read to me as a child regularly. And I have always loved the poem at the end of How the Camel Got His Hump. And although the story about the camel getting his hump has nothing to do with depression, as far as I recall, the poem at the end, there's a poem at the end of each of the Just So stories, is one in which he turns the hump into a symbol of low mood or depression. And he gives in the poem his own recipe for dealing with this hump, which is to do gardening, roughly speaking. The camel's hump is an ugly lump, which well you may see at the zoo, but uglier yet is the hump we get from having too little to do. Kiddies and grown-ups too, woo-woo. If we haven't enough to do, woo-woo, we get the hump, camellia's hump, the hump that is black and blue. We climb out of bed with a frowsly head and a snarly, yearly voice. We shiver and scowl and we grunt and we growl at our bath and our boots and our toys. And there ought to be a corner for me, and I know there is one for you. When we get the hump, camellia's hump, the hump that is black and blue. The cure for this ill is not to sit still or froust with a book by the fire but to take a large hoe and a shovel also and dig till you gently perspire. And then you will find that the sun and the wind and the gin of the garden too have lifted the hump, the horrible hump, the hump that is black and blue. I get it as well as you, ooh, ooh, if I haven't enough to do, ooh, ooh. We all get hump, camellia's hump, kiddies and grown-ups too. The book I've written about working with Berlin is called In Search of Isaiah Berlin, A Literary Adventure. In my book, I conclude with an epilogue in which I sign off, as it were, and I very much wanted to put into the book the fact of my depression, because I believe that people with depression have a contribution to make by talking about it openly and shouldn't be a taboo subject. So I wanted to mention it and also I wanted to say something about the effect of Berlin on me, the effect of his death. So this is the last three paragraphs of the book. I'm writing this 20 years after Berlin's death. Throughout these years, I continued with my task publishing seven more volumes of his work posthumously between 1999 and 2006, and then preparing a four-volume edition of his selected letters, published between 2004 and 2015, with the indispensable help of those I acknowledge in my preface, especially my brilliant co-editors, Jennifer Holmes and Mark Pottle. Although my correspondence with Berlin had come to an end, I felt his presence strongly in the texts which I was working on daily. In some cases, I was using recordings of his lectures or handwritten material, and this helped to keep alive the sense that we were still working together on his publications. This feeling was reinforced by the availability and support of his family, especially his widow, Aline, until her death in 2014, just short of her 100th birthday and his stepson, the publisher Peter Halburn, as well as other fellow trustees. For much of the period since Berlin died, I have struggled with debilitating depression. I believe that this would have afflicted me in any case, since depression runs in my family. But the timing of its onset makes it possible, or even likely, that it was exacerbated, at any rate initially, by the experience of bereavement that followed his death. He was not a father to me, my own wonderful father who outlived him by two years, 
needed no substitute. But he was an intellectual and personal lodestar, an inspirational model of truly humane scholarship, an unmatched exemplar of one peculiarly attractive, life-affirming form of human excellence and fullness of being. <laughs>